The COVID-19 pandemic raises important questions about science, society, and equity that are important for us to address together. Today's webinar is the first in a series that we'll be hosting that address different dimensions of the COVID-19 situation and that will feature discussions with members of our faculty at Drexel as well as other guests. My name is Dr. Jim Bueller. I'm a clinical professor and the interim chair of the Department of Health Management and Policy at the Dornsife School of Public Health here at Drexel and I formerly served as the health commissioner for the city of Philadelphia. Our topic today is uh, what is the status of the COVID-19 pandemic? Where are we and what might be next? Before I introduce our panelists, I just want to make three quick points. First, our focus today will be on the public health response to the pandemic. If you have questions about getting a coronavirus test or treatment for possible coronavirus infection, guidance and information about resources for those services is available from the webpage of your state or local health department. For those of you who are in Philadelphia, that would be www.phila.gov slash COVID or slash COVID hyphen 19. We've received, the second point I'd like to make is that we've received a number of questions in advance, and you can also submit questions as you watch and listen this afternoon. Each of our panelists today will provide some opening comments, and then we'll open it up to address as many of your questions as possible within the hour that we've set aside for this event. Third, I mentioned that this will be an ongoing series. Keep an eye on the Dornside School of Public Health webpage, which is drexel.edu slash Dornsife, D-O-R-N-S-I-F-E, for information about future discussions. The next one will be this coming Monday at 4 p.m., and it will address questions about the pandemic and how the pandemic is affecting health equity. Our panelists today are Dr. Esther Chernak, who is an associate clinical professor in the Department of Environmental and Occupational Health and director of the Center for Public Health Readiness and Communication at the Dornsife School of Public Health, and Dr. Michael Levasser, who is a visiting assistant professor in the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics at Dornsife. Dr. Chernak will provide a general overview and update of the COVID-19 situation, and Dr. Levasser will talk about the role of predictions or models in guiding the public health recommendations. So Dr. Chernak, please go ahead. Thanks very much, and thanks to all of you for joining us this afternoon. I'll give a quick overview as to about where we are today with respect to this virus, and then hand it over to Dr. Levasser for a discussion around modeling studies. So as everyone knows, uh, we are in the midst of a pandemic of COVID-19, a new infection caused by the virus SARS-CoV-2 uh, related to the SARS-CoV-1 virus that emerged in 2003. And this SARS-CoV-2 virus emerged in the uh, December of 2019, several months ago in the uh, city of Wuhan, China, and quickly, quickly spread from person to person via the respiratory route uh, throughout the Hubei province, um, and then eventually through China and many countries in Asia. Um, and where we are now is that it has been relatively controlled in China and Asia, but it has spread very, very rapidly to uh, throughout the world. Virtually every region of the world now has cases. And as of today, the uh, uh, World Health Organization reported that there were over 400,000 cases worldwide. Uh, more than half of those are actually now in Europe, and there have been a total of 18, more than 18,000 deaths uh, that have been, uh, that have occurred from this virus. Um, in the U.S., as of today, there are over 68,000 cases that have been reported, with just under 1,000 deaths uh, attributed to this virus. And um, for the most part in, in the U.S., the cases 
um, began in um, Seattle and King County and in California, but have spread throughout the country, particularly in highly, in highly populated, densely populated areas. In this country right now, the majority of our cases, nearly half of our cases are now in the New York City metropolitan area, with New York City, the New York City suburbs, and even northern New Jersey suburbs, accounting for nearly 56% of new infections um, in the last few days in the, total of, in, in the total US cases. In Pennsylvania, We've had over 1,800 cases reported. In Philadelphia today, 475 cases have been reported. Um, as of yesterday, 127 of those 475 actually represent new cases. So we're at a place now where the number of cases in the US, but particularly in the New York City and even Philadelphia metro areas are uh, increasing rapidly. Um, and um, at the moment in Philadelphia, we've had uh, only one death reported, but the majority of cases in Pennsylvania um, tend to be in the southeastern Pennsylvania region. Nearly half of the cases in the state, slightly more than half, actually are occurring here in the southeastern part of the state. The testing for this virus has been, I think, in the news a great deal. Um, it is currently a test done by uh, using PCR, polymerase chain reaction based technology. Um, and we've had challenges nationally um, with the limited supply of testing and the limitations have related to limitation, um, deficient supplies in testing equipment, swabs and viral transport media, deficiencies in um, reagents that laboratories need to actually conduct the test, deficiencies in personal protective equipment that uh, test collectors need to wear when they collect the tests, um, and deficiencies just in overall laboratory capacity. So many of the cases that I've mentioned now, the numbers that I'm mentioning now, clearly are just the tip of the iceberg and do not reflect the totality of cases that are likely um, across the globe, but particularly in this country as well. Um, CDC has now created prioritizations for who we should test, and for the most part, testing has focused on the sickest of people with COVID-19 infection, people who are hospitalized, people who are intensive care units, um, people who are in high-risk professions like healthcare workers and even first responders. Um, so testing has been a major challenge for us, and I'm sure we'll talk about that over the course of the hour. With respect to control measures, um, it is still true that um, as of today, we don't really have known um, effective therapies that are substantiated by evidence for this, for this virus. There are a number of things that are being tried across the country. Uh, some of those things, some of those uh, modalities represent new agents and there are clinical trials for those, including uh, compounds such as remdesivir, which is a nucleotide analog that appears to be efficacious, but is now being offered through clinical trials. There are other medications that um, exist now, but represent off-label uses of those medications. For example, uh, the armamentarium that we have for RNA viruses, uh, medications that are used to treat inflammatory disorders like lupus. You, I'm sure we'll talk a bit about the hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine compounds uh, that may or may not be effective for this virus, but are being used. Um, and there's a number of other trials that are underway to try to understand what really does work, including things like um, antibodies or sera from um, individuals who have experienced infection uh, to, try to, to try to improve outcomes. Um, as well as um, other compounds that are under investigation. For the most part, today, treatment is purely supportive, meaning we support people's ability to breathe, we support them with supplemental oxygen, and when necessary, support them with mechanical ventilation. Um, and the, the, so for, because of that, the major control measures really have relied on um, public health interventions, the so-called non-pharmaceutical interventions, and those include things like social distancing, um, things like quarantine, uh, isolation of ill people, and then identifying their contacts and quarantining those cases as well. And in many, in many ways, in many countries that have succeeded in, I think, quote, sort of, uh, uh, what we call flattening the curve or limiting transmission, um, the, the effective measures have relied on a combination of those things. Uh, the targeted isolation of cases, the targeted identification of their contacts, and then confining or isolating those contacts to limit spread. And then on top of that, larger approaches to social distancing um, that have resulted in people's, you know, recommend, in the recommendation for folks to stay home from work, to telecommute, to shelter in place, as it were, um, for a period of of, of days to weeks, and we can talk about um, the, what the optimal time frame is for that. But those things do appear to be working in many in many parts of the world, um, in the absence of effective therapy. And as far as a vaccine is concerned, there are a number of candidate vaccines, including um, messenger RNA-based vaccines and really novel vaccine technologies that 
are just beginning to uh, be studied in phase one trials. Um, the good news is that they're, um, they exist, and those vaccines, those candidate vaccines exist, and they are being studied in early trials. Um, but I think the more sobering news is that, that will take, they will take some time to, um, to be studied in ways that really ascertain their, their effectiveness in terms of controlling the spread of this virus. So that's my, my background in a nutshell. I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Lavasser to talk a bit about um, how we should interpret some of the modeling studies that bit, have been done around COVID-19, and then I guess we'll open it up to questions. Good afternoon, and thank you for being with us today. I'm Dr. Michael Lavasser, Visiting Assistant Professor of Epidemiology and Biostatistics. And today I'm here to talk about some of the modeling studies that have been conducted that have been um, used to inform many of the policy decisions in our country and others. And by now you may have heard about the Imperial College Non-Pharmaceutical Intervention Study, which was published on March 16th. This is a model that uh, was developed by a team of scientists at the Imperial College of London to explore the impact of various interventions on healthcare demand in Great Britain and the United States. Prior to the publication of this study, policymakers in the, U in the U United Kingdom were straying away from the World Health Organization's recommendations for testing, contact tracing, and social distancing measures and instead tried to accept that this ep epidemic was inevitable. Their plan was to let the virus infect people so that the UK could reach the 60% of the population required for herd immunity to take over. This study showed that without any intervention, the surge limits for both general ward and ICU beds would be exceeded by at least 30-fold under the most optimistic scenarios and result in 510,000 deaths in Great Britain and 2.2 million in the United States. These results conv uh, convinced the government in the UK to take swift action and announced social distancing measures, including the recommendation that people should avoid pubs and restaurants, work from home if they're capable, and to self-isolate for 14 days if anyone in the household was ill. Simulation models can be a very powerful tool for predict predicting the trajectory of an epidemic, and they've been used for numerous outbreaks around the world, including, most recently, Ebola and Zika. But simulations aren't a replacement for traditional epidemiologic studies. Simulations necessarily rely on the information that we have at hand and can make broad assumptions that may not reflect reality. In the famous words of statistician George Box, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Take, for example, the case of the r naught value for COVID-19. Early on in the epidemic, modelers from across the globe threw their hats into the ring to determine this key parameter, which varied wildly from 1.7 to 10.3. These informed guesses used different inputs and methods to calculate the effect. Most, however, converged around a value of 2.8, and as the epidemic has spread across the globe and more data has become available, we now more comfortably accept the r naught value to be around 2.2. In fact, the Imperial College study assumed an r naught of 2.4, but they allowed this parameter to vary between 2.0 and 2.6. Further, the effectiveness and compliance with interventions are also based on assumptions. When considering case isolation in the home, the authors of the Imperial College study assumed that 70% of households would comply with the policy, but they didn't provide any rationale behind why they made this assumption. I should point out that George Box was absolutely right. All models are wrong, but some are useful. But how do we know which ones are useful and which are not? With an ever-changing landscape of research being conducted at lightning speed around the world, there will continue to be conflicting results based on assumptions, methodologies, and starting parameters. But taking multiple models into consideration can provide a range of values that can better inform policymakers. That is to say, no one model should ever be considered the best model. Independent groups developing their own methods and using a variety of data would provide the best scope for our situation. But models are only as robust as the data that are used to build them. Models built on data that are incomplete, biased, or otherwise poorly reflective of reality will produce flawed results. And unfortunately, we don't have very accurate data right now largely due to our limited capacity to test patients and the strains are on, on our healthcare system. When your house is on fire, you don't stop to investigate the cause, you try to put the fire out. And that's where we are right now. The strongest data that we have are on deaths. That is to say, we are more certain that the data on deaths are complete. But any signal that we get from the number of deaths from this virus gives us a picture of what was happening on average 14 days ago. And we need far more timely data to respond to this crisis. When it comes to the case counts, we know that most countries and states and cities here in America do not have the number of testing kits required to meet the demand from the population. In fact, many hospitals have started only doing tested for, testing for COVID-19 if the results would change the course of treatment. 
So how far off are the reported number of cases? It's very difficult to say with any authority. And the crystal ball that I have that a friend gave me doesn't seem to work. An additional issue with the case numbers is that of low sensitivity of the PCR test that's predominantly being used for confirmation. With a sensitivity ranging from 65 to 80 percent, there are likely a large number of true cases that are testing negative. Antibody tests that are being developed may have higher sensitivity than the PCR tests. These can provide more rapid results and even be done as a point of care test in the doctor's office. However, several studies have noted that it takes an average of 11 days for the body to develop an immunity response to the virus. So what are the models predicting? Well, they all vary in when they're predicting these social distancing measures can be lifted. Some say six to 10 weeks of social distancing and others suggest 18 months. But most of the studies suggest that even after we end these social distancing measures, we'll have to continue being careful, which will include staying home when sick, avoiding physical contact with others, and isolating households when there's a positive case. If we can ramp up testing measures and fund public health programs to reliably conduct contact tracing at a large scale nationwide, we may be able to get this under control, but we have to be all in on this. Imported cases will continue to be a concern. In fact, China has reported 74 cases of COVID-19 infection from someone traveling to China from elsewhere. And as China prepares to reopen Hubei province on April 8th, we will get a glimpse of what the future may look like. However, all of this may be moot if appropriate vaccine or treatment is developed. A successful vaccine, however, will take many months to develop and test, and there are still logistic questions about how long immunity is conferred. That said, there are a number of groups doing excellent modeling work, sharing data sources, and forming interdisciplinary networks to develop, analyze, and disseminate simulation models in order to better forecast what this epidemic will look like in our country, our state, and our city. So when you see the headlines that discuss these types of models, think of them as weather forecasts. They're one version of what might happen depending on the model's assumptions and inputs. And as the data become more clear, our picture for the future will come into focus. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much to both of you. But before I get to the questions, I'd just, uh, Michael, like to ask you uh, one quick question. You, you use the term R naught. I think many people know that, but perhaps not everybody who's listening today knows what that means. Could you explain that for us? Sure. So R naught is the basic reproductive number, and it represents the number of people each individual who is infected with the virus will likely go on to infect. Great. Thank you. So we, we received a number of questions in advance of the session today, and a number of them are asking, how long is this going to last? Uh, so perhaps, uh, Dr. Levasseur, I, could, I can turn to you f here for this. Uh, even, even though the total count may be off for, for reasons that, that you discussed about the availability of testing, is it possible to predict when we're likely to hit the peak, when we'll, when we'll get to the downside of this, and, and then when things will, will start to look more normal. Sure, so, so there are a couple of key issues with, with trying to come up with, with a number like that. I've been saying six to 10 weeks for uh, quite a few weeks at this point, um, mostly based on wanting to go through at least three transmission cycles. That's I infect you, you infect someone else. Um, because that, that's when we're, we'll start to see the effect of these social distancing measures slowing this, this epidemic down. Um, but that also depends wildly on how likely people are to actually stay at home and not go out and not go to the parks and not go to the beaches. Um, and I don't know that any of us know how effective these have been. We've seen people playing in parks. Um, it also sort of depends on what happens in the healthcare setting because those doctors and nurses and healthcare workers and the people cleaning the hospitals, they're gonna go home to their families and if they're infected, they're gonna potentially pass it on to them. Um, and in the long run, even once we start seeing cases start to drop off, like where China was about a week ago, we still wanna give two to four weeks to make sure that, that the fire has really gone down and that it's, it's safe for us to you know, go back out and interact with one another again. Great, thank you. Another question that, that we received wondered about the lessons that have been learned from Seattle and particularly uh, how especially vulnerable communities uh, have been affected and, and how public health has been able to um, um, address the spread of COVID 
uh, among those who may be most vulnerable uh, within our communities. Perhaps, uh, Dr. Trunak, you could take a stab at that, or, or, or Michael, either one of you. Sure, I'm happy to address it. I mean, I think, you know, the, Seattle was one of the first major cities in this country that um, had that recognized that it had significant on, you know, what they called cryptic community transmission. And one of the manifestations of that transmission um, resulted in a nursing home outbreak with a high impact, high attack rate among, um, among um, residents of that nursing home. And I think, you know, that's, that was the fear when, when we saw this happening in China and saw that elderly people were at highest risk for severe complications and fatalities. Um, and I think um, they, uh, to their credit, I think that Seattle King County has acted extremely aggressively with respect to um, trying to interrupt transmission within that nursing home, um, screening healthcare workers and all the staff and all the residents of that nursing home, limiting visitation in that nursing home, and then I think really ramping up uh, testing so that the whole spectrum of the of this disease um, and manifestations of folks uh, of people who have this disease in the community are people are being tested so for example not just limiting testing to the most severely affected people but uh, perhaps people with more moderate symptomatology who who are then diagnosed um, and where um, who can be then isolated and, and, and their contacts identified and also and also confined as well so much of the transmission of this virus occurs within clusters, clusters of close contacts within households, within work settings, within, within identifiable and locatable um, um, epidemiologic networks. And that uh, if we have the ability to identify cases, we then have the ability to identify contacts and try to limit transmission by quarantining those contacts as well. So I think, you know, Seattle, I think was caught off guard. I don't think uh, anyone expected to be the first city, the first major city in this country to, ha that have this, uh, to have an outbreak, but I think they've acted quite aggressively. Uh, I think they're still dealing with the outcomes of the nursing home transmission. Um, but if you look at the, uh, the rate of, at which they are posting new cases, I think that they are actually beginning to, um, to level off a bit um, in the sense of uh, the number of new cases every day is not increasing exponentially there, which means their, their layered uh, approach of you know, social distancing on top of uh, expansive testing, identifying cases, identifying those contacts, and then confining them seems to be working for them. And that's a model for the country. And I think similar kinds of control measures have worked well in other parts of Asia uh, that experienced this first, particularly Hong Kong, Singapore, and Korea, where they've done an aggressive combination of uh, widespread testing, um, targeted case control, targeted contact identification and confinement, and then the social distancing um, on, top of, on top of those more targeted measures. Thank you. Thank you very much. We, we received a number of questions uh, from people who are interested in what happens when the weather warms up. We know that many respiratory viruses tend to peak during the winter months when, when we're indoors, when we're breathing heated air that may be drier. Will, will the, the coming spring and summer months give us any reprieve? And I'll, I'll ask whoever feels most comfortable addressing that to, to take that one. I think that this is a, a particularly big question. Um, I, I just don't know that we have the answer for it. Based on what other coronaviruses, the, the normally spreading upper respiratory infection um, coronaviruses do, they do tend to have a more um, uh, a seasonal effect. Um, I, I'm just not sure if we have any evidence that, that that's gonna be the case with this outbreak yet. Okay. I don't know if, if Dr. Chernak, if you had Insects. Yeah, I, I, I guess to that, I, to, I suspect that there'll be multiple things happening um, that will impact transmission as the weather warms. I think um, we'll have more herd immunity in the population, so that will limit transmission. Um, and as the weather warms, people will be outside. There's, there's, there's potentially less opportunity for intra-household transmission. And we'll have to see where we are with respect to some of these social distancing uh, recommendations in terms of folks remaining home, et cetera, et cetera. So I think there's a combination of things that, will, that might impact transmission above and beyond ambient temperature and humidity. What's concerning, I think, is that as our weather warms up and you know, our seasonal respiratory viruses uh, you know, become less frequent events, um, we will see the Southern Hemisphere 
start to get colder and we're going to probably see a pretty significant increases in transmission in the southern hemisphere which will mean that the virus is still around and uh, likely you know even if we're lucky enough to experience some more limited transmission in the spring and summer months um, we have to expect that it will come back again in the fall because it's not going away Thank you. So we've, we're starting to get some questions coming in from people who are uh, watching. Uh, there's three of them that I'm going to take. Uh, the first is a question about, uh, can, I, can I go out and jog? Can I go out and take a walk in the park? Is, is, that, is that still okay? Right, Esther, perhaps you can. Sure. I mean, uh, the answer is yes. <laughs> I, you know, I think this, this is a virus that is spread through the transmission of respiratory droplets. And, you know, we, we you know, are exposed to it when we are people who are close to us with the infection within six feet is the criteria, cough and sneeze or maybe breathe on us. Um, and so um, ways in, you know, the ways in which we limit those exposures involve staying away from people, um, but we can certainly be outside as long as we're, we keep our distance from folks and don't, you know, you know away from folks who, close enough, who, who are close enough to sneeze and cough in our direction. So I think being outside in parks, walking around, jogging, et cetera, as long as you're at least six feet away from other folks, I think that that's, that's an okay thing to be doing. Thank you. I know Commissioner Farley has emphasized in his daily press briefings, it's, it's, it's important to, to maintain your health and to, to get out and get exercise if you can and, and do it safely as you've described. Thank you. Another question that's, that's come in from uh, the audience live is a concern about transmission risks among people who may not be able to take sick leave that 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 don't benefit from uh, being employed in jobs that allow for uh, sick leave concerns that uh, uh, people who are not documented might have about their ability to take uh, time off from work or fears that people may have about seeking health care if they're not documented uh, Either of you have any uh, thoughts on, on this topic? Um, I, you know, I think those are real concerns. Um, we're in a funny place right now as a society, certainly here in Pennsylvania and Philadelphia, whereas, uh, where most people are really not allowed to come to work unless you have a so-called essential job or, or if you're working in a job that's considered an essential service. Um, so I think most people who, who might not have sick leave, et cetera, et cetera, aren't working because their jobs are ending, which is, which is a, a different kind of tragedy and a different kind of problem. Um, I, think, I think the concern about people who lack health insurance or who are undocumented not presenting to care is real. Um, you know, I think, you know, most of the testing in many places of the world in the, in the country are, are attached to health systems. In Philadelphia, we now have a couple of test sites that are willing to take people who uh, don't have insurance um, and, and test them without, without cost. But I absolutely think being undocumented, not having health insurance, those represent barriers uh, to seeking care and disincentives to seeking care and, and have, have, you know, are, are problematic because obviously people um, are going to remain at home until the latest stage of illnesses when perhaps it might be, you know, where their outcomes might be negatively impacted if they delay presentation. But they also have the potential of being um, transmitting it to household contacts and other community contacts. So those are big problems. I know that in Philadelphia, we're lucky to have a network of primary care clinics and uh, community health centers that serve folks regardless of their insurance status and their documentation status. Um, not everyone who's undocumented recognizes that. And um, unfortunately, that remains a disincentive to care. Thank you. And I think that that would be an excellent question to pose for our colleagues on Monday when they do the health equity forum. Thank you. So uh, another question that's come in is, uh, if you've had coronavirus infection and, and you've recovered, can you get it again? So there have been a couple of, of uh, reports of what they're calling reinfection, um, where someone has recovered from the illness, which means that they were in the hospital, their fever went down, and they tested negative for coronavirus based on this PCR test two days in a row. And then they went on and um, developed symptoms of coronavirus again and started testing positive again. These are case reports. There was one study, um, I believe it was out of China, although it may have been Italy. I, I read so much right now, I can never keep places in, in my head anymore. Um, but they, uh, they looked at this among four healthcare workers 
who recovered from, from the disease. And then they went into isolation for seven days, complete isolation, no contact with family. And a, a few of them wound up redeveloping symptoms. So it seems like what this is is recrudescence, which means that, that they, it's the infection coming back and not that it's a, an infection with a new virus. So perhaps to follow up on that then, if, if, if there is evidence that there's some immunity and from what I've seen, there, the suggestion that it, it, there likely is some immunity, we don't know how long it'll last, if it's a lifelong or just one or two years, but could, could people who have been infected and recovered start going back to work or, or start being out more? Is that a, is that a possibility? Yeah, and I think that that's one of the approaches that some of these modeling approaches are trying to take right now. What does that look like? And part of the question is, for how long are people infectious after they are recovered or after their symptoms go away? And there's some work being, being done looking at that right now. Um, but it's my sense that once people have recovered, they, they may well be able to go back out to work. But I would rely on the Department of Health or the governor to, or the mayor to, to make that determination. Thank you. So uh, questions come up uh, from a, a viewer who's concerned about uh, political leaders who may not be listening carefully to the, to the voice of scientists and, and experts. Uh, do you have any thoughts on, on this concern? Yes. Um, you know, who, if you're not going to listen to doctors and scientists at this time, who, who else is there to listen to? Uh, I, I think that, that we um, in public health are, are on a different kind of front line of this epidemic than, than the doctors and nurses have been on. Um, but I think that over time, we can perhaps draw parallels between other, other anti-science movements that we've seen crop up in the, in the past couple of, of years, including like the anti-vaccination movement or the, the um, flat earther movement, which I still cannot believe is a real thing. Um, and, and, you know, think about what are, what are other ways that we can engage with communities to say, instead of saying, hey, trust me, I'm a doctor scientist, instead be able to say, hey, this is how logic is working. This is, you know, how do, how do I engage with, with these people? I, I don't know that I have answers to that. And maybe Dr. Chernak, as a clinician, you have a better idea. I think it's challenging. You know, in my clinical practice, I always feel like um, some of what we, a lot of what we do in medicine isn't conceptually hard. There's nothing that is wrong with someone that I, I sh that they can't understand. Um, you know, it's not plasma physics. Um, so I, I just think we have to be patient and, and explain things. And I must say, what I would hope when we emerge from this, whenever we emerge from this, I would hope that there's a renewed emphasis on high quality science education, particularly in the K through 12 space, because people need to understand basic science. Um, and I think this, we are living at a time where I think that is, that is apparent. And I, I would add, that I think it's important for the scientists to be forthright about uh, what, what we know and what we don't know and what the uncertainties are. Uh, and the, the challenge that decision makers face is that, that they have to make very, very important decisions with very imperfect information. And they're in a tough position. So I appreciate your thoughts on that. Um, we have another question that's just come in about uh, people who have no symptoms, asymptomatic people. How, how concerned should we be about the, the, the risk of transmission from people who don't have any symptoms at all? I, that's a tough one. Um, and I think there have been a lot of uh, studies that have been tried to sort of ascertain the, de the degree to which those are the drivers of community spread. And I think it's tricky because I think, I think there's two potentially, um, there are two things that are potentially um, active here. And one is the issue of truly asymptomatic people who are out and about in the community and, you know, um, maybe not sneezing and coughing, but through breathing and, uh, you know, in some ways transmitting uh, the virus through respiratory droplets. And the other is the so-called pre-symptomatic phase, which appears to be a major problem, whereas the day or two before someone actually develops symptoms, um, they might feel relatively well, um, but are highly contagious, meaning these are high titers of virus replicating in their nasopharynx, and so they're actually highly contagious when, in fact, well, before, in fact, they recognize uh, that they're feeling ill and know to limit their behaviors. 
and, and I think that's a challenge. I think that there were those cruise ship studies that seemed to identify that a large percentage of people, you know, had pre-symptomatic phases that, or were asymptomatic, but then eventually they went on to develop symptoms, but they do represent a source of transmission in community settings. Um, so I think it's tricky. I think that um, the, the practice of recommending that folks wear surgical masks um, for the purpose of a source containment and containing respiratory droplets is a way to mitigate that, particularly in high-risk settings. Um, and it might allow people to work in healthcare settings and um, other high-risk scenarios who might have had exposures. But I, I think that I think that that is a potential problem. I, it's probably why, in fact, there is uh, there was cryptic transmission in the community. I, I also think that you know the experience of illness is a subjective one, and I think many people might feel that they're beginning to come down with something, or they might confuse. Um, early signs of this infection with with allergies or some other respiratory virus. I think, you know, my hope is that that becomes less and less common as flu season starts to die down. Um, but I do think that people with mild symptomatology in high-risk situations are a potential uh, source of infection in the community. And, it, and that's what's challenging, I think, about our testing strategy, which at the moment is focusing on severely ill people who are in hospitals and we're potentially not identifying people with less severe symptoms who are in community settings potentially transmitting it. Yeah, and when, when I think about asymptomatic transmission of a, of a disease, I, I think about like the classic example of like typhoid Mary, who had who just didn't have symptoms of, of, of typhoid and went on to infect, you know, a fairly large number of, of uh, families in New York City. Um, but the, when we're talking about, you know, she was handling people's food and not washing her hands. When we're talking about uh, transmission of COVID-19, we're talking about droplets. We're not really talking about aerosol transmission. Aerosol transmission may well be occurring in hospitals or in very, very, very close contact, like in the household. But out in the community, it's mostly going to be from people coughing, people sneezing, people coughing into their hand and then going to, to shake someone else's hand. And I think that you know the important thing to, to, to do is if you are going out in the world, the first thing you do when you walk into your house is wash your hands, 20 seconds, soap and water, whatever your, your um, uh, approach is. And then, you know, we, we can deal with it that way. I, I don't know that I necessarily um, uh, trust that there's a whole lot of transmission occurring from the asymptomatic route, but we don't have a whole lot of information on that right now either. So from me, it's a gut feeling more so than based on, I mean, it's, it's an educated guess, but it's, it's a guess. The, the studies, in, there were a number of studies in China that uh, and Korea, where people where people had the PCR test done, even in asymptomatic settings, and they did not identify a high prevalence of asymptomatic uh, people who had positive PCR tests. I don't, you know, I think we need more data, and I yeah. think what we really need is a serologic assay where we can do larger serologic surveys or sero surveys to get a sense of the true numbers of people who have had evidence of infection and then go back and understand what their symptoms were and make better predictions about what the important drivers were with respect to community transmission. Thank you. And just a, a quick follow-up, Dr. Levasseur, you, you use the term droplet and you use the term aerosol. Can you explain what the difference is and why that difference is important? Yeah, sure. So aerosol transmission occurs when a, a virus in this case um, is uh, in a gas, like, you know, when you exhale, you exhale carbon dioxide, it's, it's in a, a, you know, a, a gas bubble. Um, droplet transmission is in a fluid medium. So like, you know, when you cough or sneeze that, you know, sputum that comes out when you cough or sneeze. And so that obviously is, is heavier than, uh, than air. And so it drops faster. And that's why we say about six to 10 feet, because droplets only travel between six and 10 feet um, after you cough or sneeze. So when we're focusing on the social distancing stuff, it's, it's really focused on that. And another important piece to consider um, that I've been talking about quite a lot is that diseases that spread through aerosol transmission tend to have much higher r naught values. Things like measles and chickenpox. These you know, can have r naught values between 14 and 18. We're not seeing that with COVID-19. Mm -hmm. If we were seeing aerosol, uh, aerosol transmission with this, the r naught values would be much higher. We'd see far more cases. And I know it seems like we're seeing a lot of cases with this, but with respect to other outbreaks that have existed in history, this isn't 
as big of an outbreak. We're just seeing a lot of cases right now, and that seems scary, and maybe it is, but relatively, this R naught seems to, to fit a droplet transmission. And, and just to, to add briefly to that, a, a disease that is transmitted by aerosols, like measles, the, the, the infectious material can stay suspended in the air for a much longer period of time. So, for example, a person can come into a room with measles and leave, and, and sometime afterwards, another person can come into the room and, and be exposed to measles from the particles that are still suspended in the, in the air. And, and uh, I, I agree, it's a very important distinction to make. Um, I, I know you spoke earlier about uh, when will we see the end of this? When will this peak? Another question came in about that. But uh, in, in addressing this second time this question has been raised, I'd like to just follow back to a point, Dr. Levaster, that you made in your opening statement that the, the different models show that we might need to keep these social distancing measures in effect anywhere from four to six weeks to 18 months. That's a, that's a pretty big difference. So uh, is, is this a realistic thing that, that we might need to be dealing with this for 18 months or, or will we expect the peak to be much sooner that we could start to, to move to a different approach sooner than that? Yeah, so it's possible, but it depends entirely on, on the way that we wind up approaching this. Um, so what I've, been, what I've been thinking about has been more of a, uh, um, let's, let's get this under control right now. Let's, <laughs> let's take this hit to our healthcare system, mitigate that as much as possible, try and get those infections down so that our hospital system isn't over, overwhelmed and overburdened. Once, once that ends, we can start thinking about ways that we can suppress this virus and maybe move to South Korea's model of doing a lot more testing and the contact tracing and isolating when you're, when you're sick and, and we can go back to having you know, a functional society again. The other thought is to take the people who have recovered and put them out into the workforce mm -hmm. and, and sort of slowly open this up to people who have recovered and who potentially won't get the disease again. And that's a, a different model for, for opening things up. So I think it depends a lot on how this is going to play out. And we'll get a better sense of what's going to happen by looking at what was happening in China, by looking at what's happening in South Korea, by looking at what's happening in Singapore and Japan, and potentially Italy. I hope that we, we are, um, that Italy starts to, uh, to turn the bend soon. Thank you. And if I just add briefly, from my experience in dealing with different situations, when you have a, a, an event like this that's rapidly unfolding, our knowledge is changing rapidly we're learning every day. Just think back two weeks ago and, and how much, how differently our, our mindset is now based on what we've learned since then. And, and in public health, our response changes as the situation evolves and as our understanding evolves. And so you've mentioned that very early on that that type of aggressive case finding, contact tracing, isolation and quarantine may be where we need to be putting our efforts. When it gets to a certain dimension, then we need to be thinking about uh, social distancing measures to really slow it down. And then as, as it starts to wane, we turn back to a greater emphasis on that, that uh, uh, diagnosis contact tracing uh, approach. So I think the important point is that, that, that as we learn, we're going to, we'll see that the, the response will continue to evolve. And, and I think it is important to point out that we did have two months advance notice that this was coming. Okay. And, and we, we probably should have had a, a bit more of a, 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 an aggressive response to trying to um, do this testing and, and keeping an eye for what's happening in our community. That's my personal, you know, public health approach to this. And I think that as, um, as we start to look back on this as part of our history, we're going to hopefully be able to fund public health better and have, have stronger, be able to have stronger responses to things like this in the past. Because part of the reason that South Korea was able to respond so rapidly is because they had an outbreak of mers cov just a couple of years earlier. And as a result of that, they decided that they were going to really invest in public health. So. Thank you. So I'd like to provide some positive feedback from one of our viewers who said, thank you for doing this super informative. So to let you know that, that your audience appreciates uh, what you have to say. Uh, that, that same person raised a question about 
uh, is, is the virus changing? Is, uh, um, is there any evidence that, that, that somehow the virus now is, is different from earlier on? And, and what effect might that have? You know, I'm not sure that it is changing in ways that would make our PCR assays less sensitive. That, that's at least what I've read from the folks who are doing molecular epidemiology and the genetic sequences. I mean, there's been some really fascinating data came, coming out of the Pacific Northwest where people are actually able to identify epidemiologic linkage, linkages based on genetic sequences and the way that they evolve between transmission in transmission cycles. Um, I don't think we know enough about the epidemiology to attribute changes in, in clinical manifestations or even the epidemiology from one country to another uh, as a function of mutations in the virus. I think we just don't know enough about the full spectrum of cases because we're not testing enough. I think we just know enough about who we're testing. Um, so I, I don't know that, I, I don't think it's changing in ways that are significantly changing the manifestations of disease other than, you know, um, that, that in ways that would not be attributable to just the changes in the epidemiology in different countries, et cetera. I don't think we know yet. There are certainly a lot of work being done in this area, but it's probably not um, impacting clinical manifestations at this point, or even the ability of the, our PCR-based assay to identify the virus. Thank you. We have a question about children. Uh, the question uh, makes the observation that it appears that children are less severely uh, uh, affected if they become infected with the coronavirus. But do we think that children are a major source of spreading the coronavirus? I think we don't know, honestly. I think we know that children can be infected. We've seen that in household studies and we've seen it in, in, you know, in, in some of the epidemiology that's being now reported from around the world. I think they currently don't, most kids don't get as sick as adults do. And I think there's pretty good data both from China and Asia as well as now Europe. I think the, you know, the overwhelming majority of severe cases are in older adults, particularly older, older adults with underlying cardiovascular morbidity. But I think there've been enough household studies and case series of pediatric patients to suggest that they absolutely do get infected and potentially are a source of infection. I don't think we know enough. It's, I don't think we think it's like seasonal influenza where the driver is, of community transmission is often pediatric infections, but I don't think we know fully uh, the extent to which pediatric infections drive community transmission. Yeah, and there was one line in the, the China, the World Health Organization China Joint Mission Report uh, where they say that it, it was worded a little bit strangely for, for a World Health Organization report, but they, they said that um, no physician we talked to could remember a situation where a child infected an adult. And it just felt like such conjecture for the World Health Organization to be putting in a report. So I don't know how, it, it seemed like it was important enough to say it, but also to point out that this, this wasn't, you know, some scientific experiment to point out. So I, I think that we'll have better data on that when we can actually do contact tracing, but we can't really do that right now. Thank you. Uh, so, so much of our focus now is we're trying to flatten the curve. You know, that's the, the new uh, jargon that we're all using, which, which, which means in, a, in essence that we're trying to pre prevent a, a rapid surge or increase in uh, people who are severely ill and need health care uh, in, in ways that are likely to strain our, our ability to provide that health care. And so we've got questions about uh, that uh, possibility and, and questions around shortages. Um, what, what can we say about uh, particularly uh, personal protective equipment for healthcare workers and uh, conversations and recommendations that we're seeing come out about recycling or reusing some of that as a way to extend the availability of that important resource? I mean, I, you know, I think the short answer is we need more of it. And it's astonishing that in one of the wealthiest countries in the, in the, in the world, we don't have enough of it to protect our healthcare workers. And I think, um, you know, I think that there are two major investments that we need to make from a logistics perspective. And one is 
investing in the supply chain to uh, expand access to testing in, in, in tremendous ways. And the other is to expand access to personal protective equipment and, and other healthcare supplies to really expand our capacity to take care of larger numbers of people who are gonna be critically ill. Um, I think, you know, Atul Gawande just wrote a really interesting piece for the New Yorker magazine that I suspect many of our viewers have seen, have read, that talks about how um, um, uh, Singapore and South Korea have protected healthcare workers. And um, to me, one of the reassuring pieces or points of that article wasn't, was that, you know, with simple kinds of surgical masks, simple barrier face masks, gloves, and access to hand sanitizer, for the most part, healthcare encounters could be made safe. Um, and that was, you know, covering, you know, using the surgical mask both for the protection of healthcare workers, but also to protect um, healthcare workers from people who are coughing and sneezing in terms of, you know, source protection, et cetera. So, you know, one could, one could make the argument that if we could do that effectively, we could reserve the higher level personal protective equipment for the much higher risk situations like intensive care units, places that, you know, uh, settings in hospitals where aerosols are more likely to be generated, et cetera. So I think that we can be thoughtful about where we invest in personal protective equipment to sort of extend what we have uh, to more people and in ways that where they're, where they're most, um, most needed. I thought, I thought the article, you know, seemed to suggest that, you know, if you, if you can uh, limit, you know, limit interaction between people who might not be protected to under 10, under 10 or even 30 minutes and um, promote things like hand washing and make sure people have access to simple things like surgical masks, which are a much less expensive barrier than say an N95 respirator, you can actually prevent many healthcare worker infections and then reserve the little PPE you have that's higher level to much more high risk settings. Thank you. So we're getting close to the end of our hour. I'm gonna take one more question that's come in uh, from our audience and then ask a, a wrap up question or two. Uh, and, and the last question from the audience concerns the risk of uh, in transmission in a hospital. So we, we still have people that need to go to the hospital for reasons other than coronavirus. Or are they at danger of being exposed to coronavirus in the hospital? The answer is absolutely. And I think that's a real challenge that we have in not just hospitals, but even outpatient settings, um, where you're gonna have people who, who might have respiratory symptoms who are presenting for evaluation and people who might not have respiratory symptoms, but in fact have the virus or, or, or be mildly symptomatic. And I think, I think that's one of the biggest challenges is how do we manage that? And you know, one approach is to, is to certainly try to identify anybody with respiratory symptoms um, on entry and hand them a surgical mask so that they have a barrier to transmission. Another approach is to think about segregating the care of people with suspect or confirmed COVID-19 um, from the care of people who are presenting to healthcare institutions for completely other reasons. Um, you know, many facilities, um, including the one I work in, we're working very, very hard to keep established stable patients out of the clinics. Um, you know, we can renew their blood pressure medications and cholesterol medications and insulin, um, you know, over the phone. We're doing virtual visits so that we reserve our healthcare facilities and the face-to-face -face encounters that are needed for people who might have COVID-19. So I think, um, you know, that's happening in an outpatient basis. And I think it, it can also happen at a hospital level where you have people who are going to come in to have, you know, to deliver babies. And, um, you know, we've, we've removed, we, I think we're eliminating elective surgeries, but for sure people are going to come into healthcare facilities with heart attacks and the other reasons that bring people to hospitals and hospitals are going to have to try to be thoughtful about how they segregate patients with contagious respiratory infection like COVID-19 from those folks to try to limit transmission within hospitals. There's a number of ways to do it. Some of them are administrative. Uh, some of them re represent personal protective equipment investments, but there's a number of weighted ways to do it. It has to be intentional. So we, we just got a couple minutes left. Uh, as, as people who work in public health or healthcare, we, we're all getting questions from our friends and families. Is there just one question that, that you're hearing from your friends or family that we haven't touched on that, that you'd like to, to bring up? Dr. Chernak, well, I'll let you go first, Dr. Chernak. I mean, I think the, the big question that I'm getting, um, particularly from folks outside of the healthcare world and public health world is, when is this gonna end? How long is this? How much longer are we going to have to live like this? Um, 
Um, and, and I think, you know, the, the answer is what we've sort of talked about. So much of it depends on the effectiveness of our social distancing. I, I personally think here in Philadelphia and in Pennsylvania, um, in the southeastern region at least, there have been pretty aggressive recommendations for social distancing, and I'm optimistic that we will see dividends from those. And I think the key is to, um, and by that I mean we'll see fewer, you know, uh, new cases every day, but we're not there yet. We're not there yet. Um, you know, as and people have pointed out, it takes, it's going to be at least one or two incubation periods before we see the impact of those uh, interventions. From my perspective, the key is what do we do after that? If we're, if we're successful enough and lucky enough for those to work, um, we need to be super aggressive, use the time that we've bought to really, um, you know, shore up the healthcare system again, um, shore up the healthcare system, you know, in terms of caring for more people, and then be very, very aggressive about testing people, way more aggressive than we are now. Um, I feel like, you know, we're talking about you know, tr prioritizing testing and, you know, we have to be really clear about the fact that we're not testing enough and we have to address that head on um, because I think the way out of this is to test in ways that give us better information, better data with respect to who's sick, who's symptomatic, and allow us to really target public health interventions that, that limit transmission outside of these draconian, no one leave their house for 14 day recommendations, which which are going to cripple our economy um, and do a lot of things that are going to make it very hard to recover from this, even once we, you know, curtail transmission. Thank you. And Dr. Levasseur, you've got 60 seconds. Sure. The, the number one question I keep getting is, is how do I, you know, what is my risk if I do this or if I purchase this? And, and the only answer that I've, I, I can come up with for people, and it's, it's not a very exciting answer, I know it's not very sexy, but like the best thing that we can do other than social distancing is to just wash your hands. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's something that I've been shouting from the rooftops for the past month. But if you, you think that you've, you've come into contact with something, you've touched a doorknob or you, you know, you, you hear your, you know, someone is, is coughing before you pick up your Cheerios box at the grocery store, when you come home, wash your hands. It's something that you should be doing whether or not there is, is an epidemic in our community. And if, if we all get into this practice, then maybe cold and flu season will start to go down as well. So. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you so much. We're, we're getting a, a number of comments coming up on the chat of people in the audience who have expressing their appreciation for the session this afternoon. Uh, both of you have done a fantastic job of, of addressing some tough questions and and uh, the, one of the downsides of working in this online environment is you can't see a room full of people applauding. But if we were, I'm, I'm sure there would be. Uh, again, thank you. And uh, thanks to you, Jim, uh, for moderating and for the, the communications department for putting and, this together. Thank you. And, and uh, just remind people that Monday afternoon at 4, uh, we'll have a, another session on issues related to health equity and, and this problem. And keep an eye on the drexel.edu slash Dornsife webpage for future webinars that we'll be putting together. Thank you to everybody who turned in. Thank you again to our panelists and I hope that everybody has a great afternoon. And wash your hands. <laughs> Thank you.